I just looked up one day at uh, one of the shots and I thought, this is great. Now, I was 50 mil an hour runs into my face, hail, rain, all the horrible stuff. Everything's shaking, cameras, the bloody pictures. I just thought, I love this. Scottish Landscape Photographer of the Year, Dylan Nardini there, on what it's like to shoot landscapes in this beautiful but rainy country. Welcome to the Viewfinders Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Graham Dargie. I'm a professional photographer from Aberdeen in Scotland, the Granite City. And this is a show where we talk photography, but we go way beyond shutter speeds, f-stops and camera brands, delving into the thoughts of some of the best photographers in the world. How are you? How's your photography going just now? I'm good at the moment. I can't be complaining. Photography-wise, I just shot a little commercial photography job this morning. Business team shots, headshots, that kind of thing. And that kind of work's been a bit sketchy this last year or so, as you might imagine. And so it's always great to get out there, put my gear and my skills to work. So I really, really enjoyed that today. Earlier in the week, I hosted my Viewfinders Live event with Donna Krause. I've been talking about this for ages, so it was good to get into it. And what a fun night it was. Uh, We had an enthusiastic crowd join us on Zoom from all over the UK, Ireland and Europe. And Donna was so entertaining and so informative. I learned a lot and my favourite line from Donna on the night was if you're going to do pancakes, you've got to make it big. Uh, We've had lots of good feedback from the event. One review said the event was absolutely perfect. So that's good to hear and makes it all worthwhile. Um, I recommend you follow Donna Krause on Instagram at Donna Krause. She's got a beautiful feed, but also because she's running a competition in partnership with Nikon to win a Nikon Z5 or Z5 camera depends where you're coming from uh, and lens so follow Donna Krause on Instagram to find out more about that you can connect with the show on Instagram at viewfinders podcast or with me at Graham Dargy where you can see my photography and my latest roller skating progress if you like seeing videos of middle-aged guys falling over then you're gonna love that you can also check out the viewfinders website viewfinderslive.com where you can listen to previous episodes and find out about upcoming live photography events. The podcast is sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for buying, selling and trading used camera gear. If you've got something in your camera bag you don't use anymore, then trade it to MPB. MPB makes it easy to trade your unwanted equipment for something you will use or just sell it to them for cash. MPB trades thousands of items every week and everything you buy comes with a six month warranty. There's a link in the show notes where you can get a valuation for your kit from MPB. So thanks to MPB for sponsoring the show. Now, on to this week's episode. My guest today is the 2021 Scottish Landscape Photographer of the Year, Dylan Nardini. Dylan also won the 2021 British Photography Awards Landscape category. So this is his year. He's on a roll. Dylan's a trained driver by trade and a self-taught photographer who has a real knack for finding unknown locations and revisits them again and again until he finds them in just the right conditions. He also shoots amazing abstracts and dabbles with infrared photography. We touch on all of these things, as well as covering Dylan's photography origins, how he shoots landscapes with a 50mm lens, dropping a camera in the sea, and much more. Dylan is as humble and down to earth as you can get, but also really intentional and thoughtful about his photography. So I'm sure you'll take something away from this. Here's my conversation with Dylan Nardini. Welcome, Dylan. How are you? I'm good, Graham. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. Um, Thanks for coming on. I really, really appreciate your time. I I always try and keep a space uh, for a Scottish landscape photographer because... I don't know how much we're aware of it, but we have such a great landscape playground on our doorstep here in yeah. Scotland, you know. And um, I'm I'm really have become aware of it through the podcast, through other guests, um, and people who are not Scottish as well, saying, "Oh, I love Scotland," you know. And they they just people love it, and you're like, "Well, actually, when you see it with a fresh eye, it really is quite yeah. special what we've got to go just to go out and do." Um, so, but before we get into it, for anyone who might not know you. Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your photography? Um, I'm Dylan Nardini and uh, a Scottish landscape photographer. I've been practicing landscape photography since 2014. Um, my photography took off when I was 16 um, at high school. 
a long time ago. Um, and it was that room photography. It was all black and white films I got in my in art uh, art classes. Um, and since then, it's been self taught, jumping between different genres right up into 2014, as I say, um, when I kind of really fell in love with landscape photography. And from then, I pretty much practiced that um, and always learning, as we always are. Um, I what I love about your photography as well. You're not just shooting like one style of image, but whatever you do, I find it all really atmospheric, beautifully observed. And one thing I really appreciate is you're not just hitting all the usual locations that we know around Scotland yeah. and that we love. Um, but it seems like you're always going out looking for something different and in difficult conditions. Um, yeah. And then when I really dived into your website, you know, preparing for the chat, uh, I was really nicely surprised to see the, the abstracts and the infrared stuff. So there's a lot of yeah. stuff to talk about. I don't know if we'll be able to have time to touch on all of it. But um, yeah, let's start at the beginning. You said um, you were always interested in photography from yeah, 14, 16, I think, yeah. but 16. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd read on your bio, actually, your interest maybe started with your grandfather and your your dad's an artist as well. And I think your sister's an artist as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you've got some kind of genetic advantage there. So can you talk about <laughs> your upbringing? I mean, were you just surrounded sort of by visual creativity when you were a kid? Well, my father in particular, who's um, he's a songwriter as well and a, an artist. Um, my grandfather um, on my dad's side was, he was a bit more like me, I presume, in that he was more technical. So I was, although I liked art, I never quite got it. My, my dad and my sister are really into art and I kind of, you, 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 when you meet them you can know they're artists. Um, I was always, I liked it, but I never got a bug, I never got no, really into it and it was photography that I kind of went along that side. I liked the more technical thing. Um, yeah. At one point I was training to try and be an architect as well. All these kind of technical drawings, all these things were, were things that I liked. And I picked it up, well maybe my grandfather, he had cine cameras and and all these things that I kind of would look over and say, oh, I like that, and I like the kind of, I'd be gadgets, I suppose. Um, and then in high school, in my art class, there was a teacher there who showed me how to process and how to load the film and all that, and I did yeah. that. And then he left, and it was from then I had to do it all self-taught, and it's pretty much been the way I've, I've been, well, 30 years since then, so um, self-taught, self-taught, and then... I did a kind of open college of arts. I tried to do that for a degree was a, was the idea, but I found I was I was given far too much time to writing and on a computer, and I I thought I, I had a, a young family at the time, so yeah. those eight to ten hours you, they were asking, I was thinking I would rather be out taking photographs, and that's when yeah. I went right. I'll just go for it, um, and pretty much just enjoyed taking photographs. Obviously, I've got a full time mm -hmm. job as a train driver. So I've also got split that time between the photography and the family and all that. So, yeah. Yeah. I was reading um, in your bio again. I, one of the things that made me reach out to you actually was your bio because I thought, oh, this is a really interesting guy. Uh, for, so my bio on my website is really sparse, but yours is quite detailed. And um, so uh, I was reading something that jumped out on me was um, you mentioned that you had a job interview with a photographer or a photography studio. And it oh, sounded like yeah. a really, yeah, it sounded like a really hard experience at the time. Yeah. And um, I was wondering how that landed with you sort of in the long term, um, because I've read that, um, you know, um, wounds to your creativity, if that's the right way to say it, can be some of the, the hardest things to receive. So yeah. I was wondering what, if, if, if any, if that had an effect on you at all. It probably did. I mean, I don't think about it. I forgot I'd actually written that. That must have been probably something there. <laughs> I bought the wine one night now, many years ago, putting that on the, the, the website. But um, yeah, I remember that quite vividly But because my I was trying to get into Napier College as well. So my portfolio had went there. Uh -huh. And then I thought, I've tried this a couple of jobs and it was with a, a photographer. Um, and I went in with bits and pieces, terrible. I mean, when I think about it, I cringe just to think. A couple <laughs> of negatives and... I remember I'd even added colour with ink onto the black and white, thinking that's a nice technique. And the guy just yeah. looked at it and literally said, is this it? And then he kind of smirked, but he was really nice. I mean, he took me around everywhere and I saw everything. And, but 
yeah, now you right away, I'm not getting this job, I'm not even <laughs> anywhere near the qualified to be doing this. So um, I suppose I took a, a dunt from that. And, um, but at that time, I was just trying to find a job, to be honest. I kind of gave up on studying architecture. I just thought, I, I'm maybe come back to it. Um, mm-hmm. And I was applying for anything. Um, and then that's, I ended up in the railway a year and a half later, I got that job. And I thought I'd do it for six months. And in fact, it would be 28 years on the 17th of May. <laughs> I'm still right. there. Wow. Yeah, I could be doing a lot <laughs> worse things right enough. It's a, it's a good job. So I'm, I'm happy I landed my feet, I suppose, when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. Were you driving from the very start or do you need to work? But up the to first that? seven years was a, a second man. So a lot of the time was when you were traveling, you were sitting looking out the window. I presume that's where my love for the, the landscapes kind of came from. Is 28 years I've been looking out a window. I mean, um, mm-hmm. every hour of the day, all the weather you could think of, and um, a lot of locations that I've actually marked down and I've went back to. I mean, it's, a lot of places I find are, are, is off the beaten track, as you say, is, um, is because I get to see them from the railway and I go, oh, that could be a nice place. How do you get into there? Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I have found some kind of lovely little spots that people would never go to and never think of going to. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, I'm sure a lot of people feel and are and they have to and they're, they're just doing what they have to do for their family, but stuck at a desk all day or something mm-hmm. like that or in a factory or somewhere that they just, they maybe they wish they were out and about and be able to see what you're seeing. So that that is, I can imagine yeah. you could look at it as you're just sitting there or but if you look at it as as in you're getting to see you all over the country i suppose that's the best yeah. way to look at it yeah definitely yeah. so yeah so are, are you where are you driving are you just all over scotland or do you just stick on a particular route or something how does that work well we used to go up to uh, aberdeen um and inverness um and down to doncaster's about as far south i go down into right. england um and i go east to, to west as well so you're kind of going everywhere um the best run used to be going up the West Highlands, but um, I don't go up there anymore, but that was a, a great run. I mean, a lot of it was through the night, but you could still, if it was a clear night, you were getting all the views of the places that we all go with a camera. So, um, yeah, uh, that was that was a, a good route. Yeah. So how far up is that? Is it up to like Malig or is it further up than that? We would cross over usually about Crane Larrick. Um, and then pass on to the guys from Fort William. But I think now the MD that does go up usually go all the way to Fort William and then the, the lodge up there, but we've not got any of those jobs anymore. So Okay. So um this is becoming a different show altogether. But I know, I've talked about trains. <laughs> there must be train podcasts out there, I'm sure there are. Um so okay, so you started there in ninety three and you were saying twenty fourteen where photography really landed on you i wonder were you pottering between those two times or what was your relationship with photography between you know 93 yeah. and 2014 a lot of it was um like kind of band stuff i had people in my 20s it was your friends were in a band you would do their shots yeah. you would it was a, a bit of street photography i would try and dabble in um portraiture i love portraiture i love the emotion in the face and and trying to capture that i've just not got the confidence to to direct people um, I still, my kids, I, I like taking pics, photographs of them, but they're now getting to the age that they're not wanting to do it and stuff. So yeah. all these things was, I, I had no direction until 2014. And it was a moment down at um, Croy Shore, down at the beach. And I just remember, mm-hmm. photos were terrible. I, I show them when I do a talk. You, you see this picture and it's like all oversaturated and everything. But that experience, I just looked up one day, uh, one of the shots and I thought, this is great. Now, I was like 50 mile an hour runs into my face, hail, rain, all that horrible yeah. stuff. Yeah. Everything's shaking, cameras, the bloody pictures. I just thought, I love this. This is, and it's maybe it's a bit of solitude as well. You're getting out on your own, you're, you're, you're thinking all the time, just 100% photography and the weather and being out there. Um, and that's mm-hmm. when I went, this, this is amazing. And from then on, I just kind of followed people online and you pick up little bits and pieces and then you start to realise that everywhere you look, you're looking at light. I mean, my, my kids mm-hmm. say to me just now, you always talk about light. Um, mm-hmm. And I must really do their head in. When I, I go, look at that little <laughs> bit over there, look at that. And they're going, yeah, 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 yeah. They're sitting in the back <laughs> of a car going, yeah, yeah. Okay, Dad. But you do, once you mm-hmm. see it, and you know yourself as a photographer, as soon as you, you see light and understand it, everywhere you look, there's little 
bits and pieces. I mean, it's, you're not going to photograph them all, but you see them and you're conscious of them. Um, and I'm conscious of that as well, yeah. Yeah, it's good to train your eye like that, though, as well, isn't it? Just in, yeah. for what's happening around you at any time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I do that with my daughter as well. And I'm kind of trying to educate her to see it as well, you know. Maybe you're doing mm-hmm. that as well. But um, So, yeah, so I was going to ask you about that moment at Croy because um, it seemed like that was actually, that was a moment where it really landed on you. So, mm-hmm. uh, And I was going to ask about what happened, but I guess that, that kind of battle with the elements, that's one of the most fun times you can have. It doesn't sound like it, but when yeah, you're really yeah. up against it, I can think of one I did last year. Uh, before the whole pandemic lockdown thing started, I was down to um, Hot Craig Point. What's it called? Aber Tower, Aber Lauer. It's just on the East Nuke of Fife almost. And yeah. uh, it was it was just one of those weekends where there was like a storm, Derek or something was on. I can't remember, but it yeah. was really, really windy. So I got a video of myself really battling it. But once you're there and you're up against it, I don't know. It makes you really want to. For yeah. me, anyway, it makes me engage and really want to get it, you know. Yeah, because well, yeah, you're concentrating as well, because you're you're wiping things down, you're, you're trying to see the exposure, what's happening, what's oh, moving that quickly. Yeah, everything's a kind of buzz, I suppose, um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's subconsciously, I think, but you do get a kind of adrenaline rush. Let's talk about your photography now. Then you recently won the Scottish Landscape Photographer of the Year. Uh, and at the the British Photography Awards, um, that yeah. must have been. I can imagine. I don't know. Do you get a call or an email about that? What was it like when you when you got that notification? It was a it was a crazy week that because it was the, the it was announced the BPA was announced on the thirty first of March and um, Stuart Wall phoned me on the second of April, and I totally forgot. I was sitting down putting the dinner and the phone went and uh, and Stuart came on the phone. He's like, "Have you checked your emails?" I'm, uh, no, and, and then he tells me, going, you're kidding me on. I mean, the BPA I knew about two months before because they were asking us to uh, to make our own kind of little video of acceptance speech because there wasn't going to be the ceremony that, that normally there would be. Um, so I th- it felt as if it was within a week these two things happened. And it was like, I mean, I, I've always enjoyed the Scottish landscape photography when I missed the year last year because it, I think Stuart moved everything round. And I just totally missed the deadline. And right. in a way, I'm quite glad because I'd have split my images up. I would have been using, would you call it, the Enlightenment one and the Submerged one. Would have been in it last year and it wouldn't have been in it this year. So in a way, it's kind of it worked out quite well. Uh, Enlightenment, is that the one with the snowy hills? Yeah, there's, there's two that are very similar. Uh, one's a kind of darker one, but the Enlightenment was the one in the BPA and Submerged is the one in uh, the Scottish landscape. It's just slightly lighter. Okay. Um, different bits of light, but taken within the same 10, 15 minute slot of light. Um, ah, okay. It's a really, I mean, it's a really, obviously, it's a, quite a stunning image. The light seems like it's one of those really transient, quick moments of light that just kind of maybe yeah, came and went. Yeah, yeah. And there's a really nice kind of undulation or movement to the shot just with the shapes you know um mm-hmm, can you mm-hmm. maybe you can tell us the sort of backstory behind that shot enlightenment but the kind of story actually starts up in uh walk Inver because i was up there with a few photography friends and maybe it's the same two storms you were talking about yourself but the country was getting battered uh with two storms one after another and we We'd booked this week and we were up there um, and they were the only place in Britain that didn't have any snow. I mean, I'll be up there and you're thinking, so what's happening here? Um, and then on the Wednesday, we could stay as long as we wanted, but on the Wednesday, I decided enough's enough. We were just getting 90 mile an hour winds. There was there was no snow coverage up there at all. It was horrible. Yeah. Uh, wasn't getting any sleep because of the storm. It was battering the house we were staying at. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'll go home. I'll go and see the kids. I'll get the rest of the week off. Um, and I went home. Dropped him at school the next day on the Thursday, and I thought I'll just take a drive down the Lead Hills. I know all the, the snow was here, so it's a place I always go to. I've been there lots and lots of times. Um, there's like six little trees around the corner. That's the only trees, and you can play with them. Um, but on this occasion, I just I spent the morning. This would have been probably an hour, an hour and a half. I'd been there, and it was quite grey. Nothing was happening, and I went a walk around the path and. Um, then I could, you know, you just start to see the, the clouds thin and just that little bit of light. And I'm like, 
Yeah. Oh, I know this view. Um, I'll go around here. So um, when it did come alive, I kind of ran up about 50, 100 yards just to get some height. Uh, uh-huh. Knee deep in snow, trying to get up all the drifts. Um, yeah. Got a spot and I just started firing off, shooting as, as much as I could. The road actually runs between me and, and the shot, so it was kind of shooting over the road the way it, that it works out. So again, it's not kind of really remote or whatever. It's, it's just... Um, but it's in South Lanarkshire, so it's not a hot spot again, it's just like in the local yeah. area. And when light like that happens then, it was one of them, I thought this was really nice. And, and uh, just, I was quite glad that I managed to capture it and they were all in focus and everything kind of <laughs> fell into place. Yeah, you obviously are familiar with the location because I was going to say it's not a location that I've even heard of, but maybe that's just mm-hmm. ignorance on my part. But were you even familiar with the view? Yeah, I've got, I've got a bit five or six other shots from um, different times. And again, I would say because it's local and I get to go there all the time, it was easy for me to get to what to shoot. As soon as I saw the light, I knew, right, I can shoot along that way. Um, Mm -hmm. So being familiar with the area was definitely a help. Um, You weren't kind of going, am I missing out on something around the corner or what have you? So yeah, I've shot it many times and I was back actually. Last month, I think we got a little flurry of snow and I went back up there. Um, in fact, I think it was the start of April a couple of weeks ago and I managed to get another couple of wee shots I was I was playing about with, but nothing. Uh, there was no real light or anything like that. But yeah. again, you get to practice, you get to shoot and get to know the place. It's really interesting that you shot it before. and So I don't know what your other previous experiences were like there, but were you aware that, okay, on the right moment, this could really, really come alive? You're always kind of hoping. I have, there was once before, you, you sometimes get a lot of rolling uh, kind of mist coming over those hills. They're not that high. Right. Um, and I've been there before that that's happened. It was more like an inversion, kind of crawling over. But there was blue skies and it was burnout and it was too late. It takes a little while for the sun to come up over. So, yeah, you're kind of hopeful. I didn't expect it to break the way it did because... Ten minutes later, it all clouded over again, and that was it, dull, and it, it's, it's nowhere near the same shot. So um, mm-hmm. the light definitely made a big difference in it, and that's uh, being there, right place, right time. But, yeah, you're aware that it could possibly be nice. Um, on your website, you've got a section called Winterland, and your whole snow scenes kind of collection is really well done. I don't think it's that easy to do especially the ones that have a lot of light tones in in the whole image i just don't think it's easy to get that just right um are you you're obviously quite happy to get out there in in amongst the elements like that but you've got a great eye for this kind of minimal kind of mostly white kind of shots with some you know black details in there what what do you what is it about that style of shot that really works for you that really draws you um I'm not so sure, but I, I just know the favourite season for me is is, is winter. Um, mm-hmm. Be it the, the hours of beautiful light, soft light, um, and it's it's very accessible. You're not getting up at half three in the morning like I was on Tuesday there or Wednesday yeah. to get yeah. up and get out. Um, so it's it's a lot more relaxed. You've got the full day usually you can, if you've got time. Um, minimal shots, yeah. I mean, I like to keep it as simple as I can and. A lot of things I shoot as well, although the two shots that are in the, the Scottish Landscape Photographer um, are vistas, I'm not usually shooting wide, I'm usually shooting kind of small and, and picking out the little details, just because usually where I am there's, there's nothing nice round about it, there's maybe little bits that are nice. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe it's it's that that's kind of, it's, it's not something consciously, I'm not going out going, I'm going to try and find a kind of minimalist uh, scene. It's all kind of reactionary, mostly, and, and kind of instinctive, it feels like. Just what I see is what I, I try and capture, what I like. Um, doesn't mm-hmm. always work. There's there's a, a pile of photographs there that don't work. Um, and if you get one or two, then that's that's good. So when you get in about there and you've got the camera in hand, what kind of thing would you be looking for to give yourself a handle or starting point or a direction for something to shoot? Does that make sense? Yeah, it'd probably be because I would know... You know where you're going. You've usually been there before. Um, mm-hmm. So I've kind of got something in my head that I think this could be nice if... It's like looking at the forecast. I was looking before I come on there to see about tomorrow morning, thinking, 
could I go anywhere and you look at the weather and all the little areas that you've got marked on the map, I'll say, what's that looking like tomorrow? Oh, right, uh, and then you, I've came to the conclusion there's no point tomorrow, uh, nothing looks kind of promising, so I, I won't, I don't think I'll make it out because it's so early, but mm-hmm. it, it's just about trying to, I don't know, it's, it's trying to find something that, that appeals to you, um, but knowing the place is definitely, that's, a, that's some kind of background work, I suppose. You know where you're going, you know what you're going to shoot, mm-hmm. there or thereabouts, and if it is a nice light, then it's going to be, you, you, know, you know where to go. That's the, kind of the, the basics of it, really. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I, for me, like, I've always seen more of a, you know, like the local stuff is not exciting me, more of an exotic location shooter, so I would be more mm-hmm. inclined to drive across the sky or something than... Yeah, do yeah. something just nearby so I'd be more inclined to get up at two and do a long drive to get to somewhere than do something local and um, just when you're saying that well I just discovered a, a really nice local coastline we live on the coast here we live like yeah. less than a mile from the coast a um, kilometre maybe uh, and there's a cliff walk which I, I've always known was there but I just discovered there's an amazing view there's a stack there's a waterfall coming out off the cliff I just discovered this two days ago and um, I was saying to my friend who was there with me, I was like, if this is in Harris, people would be paying money yeah, to yeah. come and see it. But it's just here. Nobody knows it's there, you know. So mm-hmm. I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's something I'm having to learn as well about seeing, really seeing what's on the doorstep and actually taking the benefit of it being so nearby and actually yeah. working it and going back again and again Um and not not taking it for granted, I suppose. It's really interesting that you say that. It really, it makes me want to do a more revisiting of local locations. I suppose that's what yeah. I'm getting at. Um, so, yeah, I was really happy to see the infrared section on your website because yeah. I don't think this is something you see a lot of nowadays. It used to be see more of that a few years ago. But I think in the digital era, it's kind of fallen away a bit. Yeah. Um, so for anyone who might not know what infrared photography is or what it's like uh, and the effect that it creates, can you sort of describe um, what that is for us? Well, it's, um, it's a converted camera that I've got. I think you can, you can do it with filters and what have you, but it's basically picking up the ultraviolet ra- um, waves on so your grasses are going to become white. I, do, I only shoot black and white, um, and I, I, I never kind of, I've never worked with the colour in the, the infrared. But just getting your grasses wet, your leaves, any foliage, it was basically a way for me to get through summer, which was my kind of worst season for myself, because for lots of reasons, but everything blandly is kind of green. Um, being able to go out then, and you can shoot during the day, obviously if it's too bright, it's too bright, but you're still just getting little subtle touches of, of light, and going back to black and white was almost reminding me of my, my film days. Um, so there was a bit of that as well, and just kind of stripping it down and getting away from all the, the, the greens that you see in, in summer. Um, it's a bit of a marmite kind of genre. There's, there's people who like it, and there's people who love it, and then there's others who think it's no, it's not the naked eye. You shouldn't be making things like this, and that. I just I, I enjoy it. It gets me through the <laughs> summer, um, and some of the images can be nice. And again, you can shoot. I like it a bit of drama. There's people that, that do far better than myself with it. Um, but I've got, a, I just convert, got a, a D80, a Nikon, I should be a Nikon anyway, so just being able to get one that was converted makes it so much easier. I can use all my lenses and sometimes yeah. just put it in the bag and you can go a walk with the kids and, and, and maybe even in, in woodlands in the, uh, in the summer again, little pockets of light that are too harsh to normally shoot, just being able to pick them out again and mm-hmm. you can, little intimate scenes, these kind of things. It's, um, I think it's well worth a practice. If you're not shooting in summer, I would I would recommend it. Um, although you can use it all year round, obviously. Yeah. But um, it helps when there's a, a lot more foliage. And so the the sunlight needs to be on the foliage uh, to really get the effect. Is that right? Not always. Um, even reflected light is uh, is good enough. Okay. Um, it's just really the the UV that it's picking up. So. Yeah, it's got to be bright. If you if it's out and it's a grey day, then and there's no light at all. You, you pick up bits and pieces, but it'll be quite flat. It'll be a kind of flat yeah. black and white. I mean, it's the same as if you were shooting black and white. But when I've got it set up in the back of the camera, I've, I've got the profile on black and white, so you're kind of 
seeing what you're shooting and all that as well, you're kind of getting a, yeah. an idea. Um, but obviously, you need to convert it once you, you come back into Photoshop. There's a process okay. that I've now got. I've got it in kind of presets. So if I had to do it manually, I'd probably forget how it's done because I've set it up. It's now click, click, and then you can start yeah. just working like a normal image there. Yeah, your blacks and whites and exposure and stuff like that. Did you buy the D80 already converted or did you convert that yourself? Yeah, I picked it up on eBay or something. Um, okay. I'm sure it was only about £150 or something like that. I mean, it's um, before that, I was trying to do it with, with, with a filter, but you're having to shoot everything kind of quarter a second and it's a tripod and stuff. Yeah. Having it converted, you can just shoot as normal and it's, it's, it's bright in the summer anyway. So, yeah. Um, it's been a so, better process. I've enjoyed it. So the the so the picture that comes up on the screen on the camera is it just like black and white or does it look like the infrared picture that you see after the process? No, it looks like the infrared picture. It's, they've, it's converted it yeah. um, into black and white. But I mean that's just a JPEG. I shoot raw, just the same, and then I've got to convert it. So it gives me an idea of what I'm going to be getting. So um, I'm still converting it myself. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's really cool. I recommend anyone to check that out, and if they haven't. If they don't know what we're talking about, it's I, I like it. I mean, I can get why some people might yeah, not like yeah. it, but uh, I think it's quite striking. And um, you used to just do it with infrared film, you know, um, and a film camera. Yeah, yeah. But, um, okay, that kind of segues into your sort of abstract art section because this was another pleasant surprise for me. I think I was looking in your print shop and I was expecting, you know, the the weathery kind of scenes that you get. You've got a lot of weather, um, rainy kind of weather yeah, pictures. Yeah. And uh, when I went uh, on your print shop and I saw this bright abstract kind of, I don't know if it was a multiple or an ICM or something like that. And I was like, well, I didn't see that coming. That was really, really cool. So, yeah. Um, yeah so are you working with ICM and multiple exposure or uh, what's your kind of process with that work? It's like a mix of both. Um, ICM is, um, is part of it and multiple exposure in camera. Now with the, the, the Nick and D850. Yeah. I'm, I, but I'm still learning. I mean, to be honest, I'm, I, I listened to your, a couple of your podcasts. Uh, was it Shona Perkins and I've listened to um, Valda Bailey. Valda, yeah. lucky enough to meet once. Um, and uh, her and Doug Chinnery were the kind of people I was... I, I did a workshop years ago with Doug, a couple of workshops. He was great. He's been a great help. And he kind of went into that direction with all his photography. And I've kind of followed that and tried... Not very well, but I try every so often. I'll, I'll have a little go of it. Um, and a lot of it can be even household stuff to get through, especially the pandemic. There was a, things just to, to practice that. Mm -hmm. And I always remember Valder saying to me once that it's um, was it mental gymnastics when you're practicing. Because like, you, you, you just get so many things. You've got to, you can't just go out and go click, click, click. Yeah. You could be sitting for an hour uh, and working on an image. Um, I enjoy it. But I've got to be in the right mood for it. But sometimes I'll go with months and I won't I won't touch ICM or uh, multiple exposure. But I went out on Wednesday there actually up to the Trossocks and there's a the quarry up there and it, it, it was it was too bright. Uh, uh, my other photography was kind of past. There was nothing happened in the morning. But I went about and I was just playing again. I just found an hour to go right if you're moving it here. So I was kind of mixing the ICM and then multiple exposures and talk and trying to you know, place them and think about what's happening and, and understand what could happen. Yeah. It's a, it, it, it's a hard, definitely a hard thing to try and do. Yeah. Um, but if it comes off, you, it, I, I, I like the, maybe that's the outside, maybe it's from my, from my father, I'm getting that little bit that I'm kind of thinking it's a, a bit more arty than, mm -hmm. a, than a straightforward kind of landscape photography mm -hmm. point of view it's, it is in it but it's also technical as well with like the way you've had to you have to expose yeah. it and things i mean i to me I, yeah. it's not something i've really parted with i don't think i've had the patience to really do it i mean not to the standard that you're doing it in valda but i think it just takes a certain freedom of mind to be able to even conceive that you could do it you know um so mm -hmm. yeah so you will there be a particular, oh, this is a, maybe a difficult question, but a particular type of scene that will trigger you to want to do it, or is it more about the mood within yourself? Probably the mood within myself. If I can, I've, I've kind of got to set myself to say, uh, maybe if there's textures like in the quarry on Wednesday, 
it was the textures I liked, and instead of, I could shoot macro and, and kind of just try and pick up the colours of the, the slate that was that had algae and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe a couple of multiple exposures. And then I was kind of working with the house light, thinking I could maybe try and paint with that, with ICM. So I put on a, a, an ND filter just to slow everything down. Yeah. Um, and I was just mixing them together. So I think I've got to be in the, the right mood for it, definitely, because sometimes it's the last thing on that. It doesn't even come into my head to, to shoot ICM. It, it's only, well, maybe if it comes in, I'll think, I'll maybe give it a go. And once I start, if I've got time and I'm not in a rush and I'm not thinking I need to be anywhere, you can get into it and, and sometimes you get something. Um, but it is definitely very technical and very kind of, well, it's valid to put it now, mental gymnastics. Now it's, you're just constantly thinking, what do I need to do here? I'm going dark mode, light mode, exposure wise, and, and all these things are going through your head, but it's, it's good in the end. Yeah, I enjoy it. Well, I, I recommend anyone to check out that section. It's the abstract art section of your website. It's really, really cool. Let's talk about gear for a minute. And the gear round this season is sponsored by MPB. Um, so, okay, Dylan, when you dive into your camera bag, what is the first thing that comes out, sort of camera and lens combination? It would most definitely be it's the, the Nick and D850, and I've got the 50 mil. I'm quite a fan of the AIS, the old 70s kind of uh, prime lenses. Uh -huh. One, because they're a lot cheaper than, <laughs> than your 12 and 1500 pounds new Nikon. Uh, but I've worked with them for a while and the 50 mil one, F 1.2, just love it. I mean, it's, it's so atmospheric. It reminds me of the old film, even when you shoot, especially shooting wide open and stuff. Um, that's usually my first. Other than that, I've got a 105. Prime as well, AIS. I've got a really cheap 80 to 200 AIS that's, I think I picked it up for £80. Pounds. Right. Um, but it actually does, it's so much lighter than I've got a Sigma 70 to 200. Mm -hmm. The weight difference is unbelievable, so you just fling that on. It's not weather sealed or anything, but when you're out and about, it's, it's sometimes good just to get those those long shots and you want a little bit lighter in your bag, so yeah, that's usually in there. Um, and if I'm really lazy, I have got a and I can 24 to 70 um, AFS, so that can cover a lot of stuff if I, was, no, I just want to take one lens, possibly. Yeah, and so do you, is that 50 your go-to for landscape scenes then? M mostly, yeah. That's kind of the, the ideal focal length is what I like. It's, okay. it's just bringing it in enough, um, not too wide. Um, I do, I've got a 21 mil, um, the Zeiss, the Distagon. Yeah. Um, I find sometimes just too wide. I did have a 25 that I loved, mm -hmm. but that fell in the sea with my Nikon D810 a few <laughs> oh, years ago. No. So when I replaced it, I got the 21 thinking I'd like it, and I wish I'd just got the 25 again, because um, it was just a little bit tighter. Yeah. Uh, I preferred that. Okay, we need to know the backstory. What happened with the 810? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, it's up at Durness. If, um, <laughs> I, I got it back, but it, it did fall in. Um, it was Mark Littlejohn, I was up with him in a workshop uh -huh. and uh, it was pouring, it was one of those days when you thought we should just have gave up but because we were there we were driving everywhere and yeah. we'd go out and I, I put down the, the tripod, I was in, just got there 10 minutes and I set it up and I thought right I'll go back and grab another lens and it was, yeah it was rough but it was just in the waves, not much mm -hmm. in it. And one came round the back, just as my way back. And Mark saw it, and I saw it, and I tried to grab it, and it just tipped. <laughs> and it, I've got two shots that I say it's the death of a, an 810, and it's bubble, bubble, bubble. Um, <laughs> and that was it. It just, that was it. Fried. That was it done. Luckily, Mark had a, a D800. He shot me nicking as well, so I could use all my lenses for the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. um, but on his body, um, he'd a spare. So that was a lesson learned. That was... Um, can I always very apprehensive with the sea now when I go back because um, I'm always holding on to it and I've got a strap now and make sure I'm not going too far. Yeah. You know, expensive. I tend to leave the tripod and wander off. Someone was telling me, oh, I was watching your video and you just wandered off and left your tripod behind you and it was in a river and I was like, it's in the river Co. It's like it's wedged in amongst some rocks and stuff. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, you do need to be so careful. It's such a horrible feeling when you see it going. Oh, and it, that's... Uh, it was gut wrench, just tipping over. Was, oh. 
So that was, would be a good time to um, trade that one in to MPB. Anyway, but um, other, <laughs> other than the lenses and stuff, are, have you got some filters in your bag as well? Filter, yeah, I've got the, the, the usual kind of graduated filters, but there's a, a three-stop, two-stop, one-stop. Don't use them that often. Um, I've got a, the, the big stopper as well. I, I, rare, I actually had it out last week. I went to the, the beach because we, we could go. I was first time back down the beach. Yeah. And I think that was the first time I had a, a 10 stop on for a year, a year and a half or something. Mm-hmm. I just, it's just not something I, I usually shoot with. Um, but uh, other than that, it's pretty standard. It's um, it's the, the case. It's the case adapter I've got now. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have the Lee one, but that fell off on that quarry. That was a and I've never found it again, right. so it ended up, I, I reinvested in it, it was a case I went in, but I still got the leaf filters, it's just the adapter. Okay, so is that, does the case uh, adapter hold on better than the Lee one? I think it is, it's because it's got the magnetic uh, circular polarizer, right. which I think Lee does now as well, but um, at the time it was cheaper I think, so it was a case if I'm replacing it, I'll try something different, and it just pops on so you can put it on and on off on off so yeah everything works a lot better than the, yeah the, the old way but i think as i say i think lee's moved on as well to, to something better okay the, mag- the magnetic filters when you think about it it makes so much sense but um yeah, i use yeah. the lee um the old this it's like you know they've just renewed the style of the filter holder not long ago so i have got the old style one which is fine it goes on and off so well but it sometimes it comes off a little bit too easily if is that um, the little spring one yeah 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 that's the one i had before yeah yeah i've dropped that a couple of times but um anyway right. anything in your bag dylan that you just never use i've got the usual you've got your little bag of compass and all these kind of things that are for emergencies and touch wood you never need them um they're all in there but they, they never get used but i was surprised um on wednesday i actually had my ski gloves luckily i'd left them in there mm-hmm. and it, it was absolutely freezing and, and wednesday morning and it was like a, a I'd have had to go back down if it wasn't for me having them in the bag, so right. they're always good to keep in there no matter what time, especially in Scotland. Yeah, I yeah. Maybe even need them in July. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would have gloves on all the time, but anyway, most people have something in their camera bag that they don't use, so why not trade it in to MPB for something you will use? MPB buys, sells, and trades thousands of items each week, and everything comes with a six-month warranty. So I'll put a link in the show notes where you can get a quote for selling your unused kit to MPB, And I'll make a link to all the gear Dylan mentioned. So thanks again to MPB for sponsoring the gear round this season. Okay, that brings us to a round I call double exposure. And so I'm going to ask you about one one shot of yours in particular. I might ask you about two um, that really grabbed me. And I'll throw it back to you to tell us about one particular image or moment from your photography journey that really stands out. So, yeah, the one I really wanted to ask you about was one of the Scottish Landscape Photographer of the Year shots. Uh, and it's it's a, a tree and a rainbow on the Isle of Arran. And um, it's just really super atmospheric, wonderful light on there. Everything I always think I want at the same time in a landscape shot, just rain and sun at the same time. Um, yeah, but yeah. what was really interesting to me was the, the sort of tension in the shot of the tree sort of is pulling out one side of the frame and the rainbow traveling out the other side of the frame. I think that was quite unusual, really. And um, yeah, so I was just wondering about the backstory and that or anything you could tell us about that shot. That's over in Arden's a, a holiday spot that we go to, um, especially every Easter. I go with my wife's family and uh, I always get a couple of hours and a few more ones I pick, I go out. And so I've got to know the, the place quite well. And, uh, a few little spots that I like to return to. And that's when I, um, I went there with Greg Witten and uh, Mark Littlejohn a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And we were driving in the rain, horrible weather. And I'd said, well, down here's quite nice. I hadn't came across that tree yet, but I'd been round about the woodlands and, and I knew the view. Um, and, and we stopped off, myself and Mark and another couple. Um, and they went a little wander in the rain, horrible weather. And funnily enough, Mark went his way, I went another. And we, we met. Just at that tree, and then it's like I just shot it. Mark goes, I've just shot it with my phone. This would be great, and, and this if it was in the right conditions, and blah blah blah. So from then on, whenever I returned, I, I was back there another twice um, after that, and I would keep going back. And of course, in this morning, I knew there was going to be there was possibly a touch of snow in the hill. That's what I was going for. Um, mm-hmm. And I got there first thing in the morning, um, 
and it was it was a bit too bright and it was like oh that's nothing's going to happen and then all of a sudden the weather comes in it must be prevailing winds obviously caused that tension in that tree um and and it's just shaped that way so i found the right angle i was i was kind of trying to shoot the mountains out in the background um but it clouded over and of course when you get a rainbow it was quick snap 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 i've got about another five or six trying to get the full bow over the tree and never quite worked yeah. i actually stitched a few together to get it in it was that wide that i couldn't get it in the the, the 21 mil um yeah. so i tried to stitch it but it never stitched well whenever I, I did it so luckily i also went to the side and tried to capture as it was blown through it actually went away um right and it was it was just beautiful light i mean it's a kind of similar theme as it's somewhere again that I've been to, so I, I wasn't kind of in pressure going, maybe there's another tree that's nice along there. There is yeah. a few nice trees, but not the lots kind of stand alone. They're mm-hmm. more my group. So it was good just to be able to relax and say, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for something happening. I'm in the right place. Uh, and, and luckily, again, similar to Enlightenment and Submerged, there's, but it was a, a nice bit of light and I happened to be there to, to take it. But... I suppose if you don't put yourself in those positions, it's not going to happen. So there's a lot of failures. I've got other pictures of it. Even the same day, it wasn't anything special. Um, I went back last summer. We got a, a week and I went back up. Everything's green, brown in the floor, blue sky. And I thought, nah, it's, it's nowhere near. No, you wouldn't even maybe go back if you'd seen that. But mm-hmm. obviously the atmosphere helps when you get some. And that's what I kind of try and find a little bit of atmosphere. That's what kind of attracts me to landscape photography. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're good at finding it. I mean, you. It's so funny. You went for those uh, the snow on the hills behind, and you can now you can't even see them. But the mood yeah. from that rain. I mean, it's, it's you can. It's just you can. I don't know if it's just going past or if it's coming towards you, but you can just about reach out and touch it. It's amazing. And that was. I was going to ask if that was shot with the fifty, but you said that was with your twenty-one. I think that was a twenty-one, if I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm just quite taken by the idea that you shoot landscapes with a 50. I would be thinking that it's so tight, but it's obviously working well for you. Yeah, I mean, you can obviously, you can, if you're wanting to do the one with the, your standards kind of foreground and then drifting off into the back, then I'd be using a 21 or, 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 or maybe the 24 on the, the 70, uh, 2470. I'd maybe be using that a bit wider. Yeah, but mm-hmm. if I'm going about and it's going to be in my hand, if I'm shooting now, handheld it would be the 50 that would be in and but it'll probably be because i'm kind of honing in on something or a little area um mm-hmm. whereas if i'm setting up yeah maybe seascapes i would usually find them I'm, I'm looking for a foreground so i'm, I'm shooting a lot wider but mm-hmm. most of my stuff's woodland or kind of walking through the kind of hills and stuff mm-hmm. let me ask you about one more and it just it really jumped out at me i love it it's my kind of picture but it's, it's a little bit different maybe from a lot of the other stuff that's on your site. And it's at Loch Katrine. And um, it's sort of, it might have been shot with a longer lens just by the look of it. And there's all these bare kind of white trees. It's quite a monochromatic kind of image. Um, and there's one with a bit of colour on it in the sort of upper left kind of area of the frame. Uh, and it, the caption on Instagram it says a little bit of light on the windswept banks of Loch Katrine. Um, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Twile on the Lady of the Lake. Does that ring any bells? Yes, because I was on the it was on the boat with the kids, um, and I just said it would be the uh, seventy two hundred, and I was just shooting right. little bits that were on the, the, the side of the lock, um, and I, I was attracted to that little bit just because it was it was uh, standing out, and it had just a little bit of light on it, and it was, I think that would have been last October if I remember right. Um, that was a we managed to stay in the wee cabins up there for a couple of days before lockdown kicked in again um, mm-hmm. and we got out and it was freezing and cold and it's all that kind of stuff there was snow in, the, in Ben Venu and a little bit um, Ben Ann around about us um, and I mean so it's nothing special it's, it's me from the top of the boat you went out it's not as if I've walked anywhere um, I had found mm-hmm. a few spots that I really like there that I'm going to go back to actually I, I did go up into the, the hills and I found a, a great couple of little bits for next autumn or, or next winter when hopefully we're allowed to go back up there again um, mm-hmm. but yeah yeah I remember that shot yeah it's a really nice observation just beautifully shot and um, one thing I was talking with uh, another photographer about Magnus Lindbom he's a Swedish guy was yeah. about he shoots a lot with a longer lens and um, we, were, we were talking about that and I've, I've done it occasionally I'll, I'll whip it out if I see something but he was saying some of the scenes that you would 
shoot with a long lens, you just wouldn't see them unless you had it on your yeah, eye, you yeah. know. Um, so I think along with your your use of the 50, I think there's a, more and more people are using longer focal lengths yeah, in landscape definitely. photography. Yeah. So I think it's a really interesting time in landscape photography. Things are definitely changing than what has been established for years up until the last couple of years. Um, yeah. So, yeah, wondered if there's a, a particular shot or moment that is just a great image for you, a, a favourite, or just a, a really great backstory to go with it. Um, I suppose the one I kind of talk about now and then is um, is one in Loch Tron, and it's it's monochromatic, it's black and white, and it's there's a tree that a lot of people will shoot from the, the road as you go by Loch Tron up to Loch Atlet, um, and I've, I've shot it a few times, and it's it always had a little partner, that was that sat next to it, mm-hmm. and my my brother and sister in law live up in Aberfoyle, so a lot of time we can go up there and we stay with them, and I can nip up in the morning and get out, which is, is good as well as going up any other time. Um, and this occasion, I just got up in the morning, nothing had happened. I was up at Walkartlet, and it was it must have been middle of winter, I think, and we had a few storms. This is about four or five years ago, and I just got the the Sigma seven eight two hundred. So again, it was a, a, a long shot and I was going out just trying to, to use it and see what I could do with it and stuff. And as I went past, uh, coming back to go get a cup of tea, um, I saw the tree and its little partner had been had broken off because of the storms. So mm. it, it's just lying on its side, but it's still standing there. So I jumped out and I, I went, I'll take maybe a little record shot just because I've got all the other ones with the two of them standing there. But just mm-hmm. as that, there was a, a blizzard came through. So I was like, oh, quick, get it. And I got back the atmosphere again. Um, but I had to shoot it at like 1600 ISO. So it's quite grainy. But mm-hmm. because of the grain and the, the blizzard that, that kind of passed through, I had to shoot handheld at the top of the car. I'm shooting away. Um, and the, the texture that I got for that image was the first time I realised, look, I can shoot at 1600 or 3200 if I need to. Mm-hmm. It, it actually for me, made the image because it has got so much texture in it. Um, and I sh- if I, when I print it, I always print it on a textured paper as well. Mm-hmm. Again, it just gives it, it's, it, it's up in the house. Um, one of my wife's favourites, which is always helpful when you get the approval. Um, <laughs> but that's that, that, that was always a little lesson for me to say, you don't need to be on the, the tripod, you don't need to be all set up. It can be more reactionary and maybe from then, it's part of my learning process, I've realised that Look, you can shoot anywhere, anytime. Mm-hmm. Um, little bits that occur. It wasn't even anything about light in that occasion. It was just that mm-hmm. you got a bit of depth from the weather. Um, and obviously there was a little story going by. I mean, when you see the little tree that's fell next to it, you're going, well, God, been, he's been standing there together for so many years. And I mm-hmm. shot it when it was green, when it was yellow in the autumn and all that. So um, that's I would say that's one of my images that I, I like. It's one of my favourites. Yeah, it's really. I'm looking at it now. It's really poignant, actually, and and that when you see the the one that's fallen down and the one that's still standing, it really can make you think and make you feel. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, a great lesson with regards to the the freedom of shooting at the higher ISO, and yeah. we get so bound by rules sometimes, and yeah. landscape photography in particular. I think it's 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 really freeing to be able to shoot without those rules i don't know do you know uh, paul sanders work at all yeah oh yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah he's, he's a wonderful guy and i just yeah. spoke to him a couple of weeks ago for so he'll be on this season as well oh good, good and yeah. uh, so he was talking about you know things not being good or bad just different you know and i yeah, really yeah. find that challenging and freeing so yeah thank you so much for sharing that and that brings us to um, around a quick fire round when we're nearly at the end of the show here it's motor drive is what I call this round so right, yeah. um, we've just got some quick fire questions okay ready yeah go wide angle or telephoto telephoto coffee or tea coffee expensive lens cloth or the corner of your shirt corner of my shirt if it's there <laughs> cool <laughs> um, how about a shirt with a lens cloth on the corner that's just something I'm thinking of inventing I think we should go for it. We'll go half hours with it, yeah. <laughs> cool. We'll sell millions. Um, what was the last great book, movie, series or album you experienced? Uh, if I was to go with books, it would be Paul Wakefield's book I just managed to pick up um, photography-wise. Um, 
that's, that, that's been great. That's just been able to sit with that and, and look through it. What kind of photography is it? It's, it's landscapes. It's, it's a landscape book, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Uh, what's a weird thing that you keep in your camera bag? Uh, it used to be a lot of biscuits um, just to get me through. Um, mm -hmm. But I've managed to cut them down. Um, I suppose... Oh, I, I had it out the other day. A little sponge uh, seat that you can put down when the, the rocks are wet. I uh -huh. forgot I had it and I found it Wednesday and I put it down because I was sitting there for about two hours in the, the cold. And I thought, oh, that's right, I've got that. So, so is it just like a layer of sponge or...? Yes, it's a layer of uh, polystyrene or sponge, but it folds up into it. It's got bobbles or the term, I don't know. I, I probably got it for a birthday present for the kids or something. And I forgot it was there. But no, it was handy for just putting down, and putting on the rock when it was freezing. Right. So this is, is it a photography foam or is it... I think it's just for outdoor people with a, for that kind of purpose, for sitting on, sitting about. Well, I'm just, I'm, the only way I'm following on that, up on that is because if they can sell that, we can sell the lens cloth corner oh, shirt. Definitely, sure yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, after the pandemic, what is the one location you'd love to get to, photography location? I'd like to get back up north. Um, I was meant to go with the same guys again, uh, back up to Lochinver and hopefully get some snow this time and what have you, but uh, it was cancelled again in February, so we've put it off to next February. Um, in fact, I've got a trip just just been uh, booked for Shetland, which I'm looking forward to uh, with right. you and Ross. Um, we're hoping to sneak up there um, if there's no more restrictions, obviously, the, near mm -hmm. the end of the year, which is somewhere I probably wouldn't go again. And I'm actually really looking forward to a totally different landscape from what I'm used to as well. There's going to be no trees and it's going to be no trees, yeah. 100 mile an hour. It's all going to be seascapes mostly, I would imagine. I um, right. need to do some research myself, but I'm looking forward to that just ah, for cool. something really different. Brilliant. Uh, last one. When do you feel at peace with the universe? I would need to say sitting with my family. It's got to be the best. Uh, sitting there with the, the girls and my wife and, and just knowing there's nothing to do. That's it. That's pretty much it. I should say being out in the outdoors, but I would say it's, it's got to be the family. No, you're right on. Really good answer. Thanks a lot, Dylan. I'm super grateful for your time. Well, thanks for having me and asking me. No, no problem. I mean, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm really excited about your photography and uh, I hope people check it out. There's so much more to look at than we've had time to talk about. So, um, yeah, thanks and all the best. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, Dylan just leaving on his motorbike there, I think. Thanks for listening. Follow Dylan on Instagram and check out his website. Links and links to everything else we spoke about are in the show notes. If you like this episode, then check out my conversations with Father Bailey, Paul Sanders and Magnus Lindbaum, whose names all came up in this show. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your photography. I'll see you out there.